I'm looking for butterbean curry. Let me explain. Something you should know about me by now is that I love food, and I'm on a mission to try as many cuisines as possible. There's one cuisine I've been wanting to try for years, but haven't been able to, because you can't find it just anywhere in the world. It's a cuisine that's over 300 years old, born from slavery and colonization, and the mixing of different cultures in a single neighborhood, a neighborhood that's still alive today. This is where it all started for mm. South Africa. Mm. It all started here. Mm. It's, it's sort of the cradle. This is the Bukop neighborhood in Cape Town, South Africa, home to the Cape Malay community, and the butter bean curry I've been dying to try. We gotta get curries. I'm not leaving Cape Town without eating Cape Malay curries. It's impossible. This one is close by. I'm down wherever. Cape Malay house. Closed. closed, okay. Closed. And then where's that other one that I saw? One, two, three. I was dreaming of you. Dreaming of you. Just to show you the, the, the Muslim community in Cape Town, they, they close on Sundays. Very haram. I'd love to tell you that we found a restaurant that was open five minutes later and that I had the curry of my dreams, but... We're not cooking for the Food Network, you know what I mean? It's like... <laughs> You can't say that. Why? You know, I'm serious here because I have prepared. We are making punchi keri. Amazing. But butter beans. Hi guys. What's up, Jacob? What's up? <laughs> I'm sure people will recognize Jacob from different parts of the series. He's the director in this episode. Thank you, Jacob, for letting us use your kitchen too. This doesn't mean that I didn't get to have this curry in South Africa. It just means that I was craving it a year later, so I decided to call up my dear friend Selwa. Can I just, I have a disclaimer. Okay. That my skill is not amazing. So I would say it's about like, in terms of actual, I would say maybe a three. Are you mainly worried about the aunties who might see this and, and, and judge you? Is that, is that the main worry? It's actually, it's only the aunties. This is Selwa and that's Sharif. They took me around Bukup last year to learn about the neighborhood they grew up in and to help me to track down this curry. We recently launched a Patreon where you can get exclusive content, access to live sessions, and a bunch of other cool stuff. It is a great way to support our work as we tell these stories from around the world. This is the this one. Well, it's the the oldest house in its original form, and it's quite unique, right? There aren't yeah. many places in Cape Town or South Africa that have this color, that have no, this yeah. dynamic. No, absolutely not. I wish I was that cool when I was a kid. <laughs> no. I love how colorful this is. It's just so vibrant and so different to anything else in the city. Oh wow. But the story behind these bright colors begins in a much darker time. It's such a mix, like even the dress. Yeah. It's like, even like, you know what's funny? It's like, a, you make fun of it now because people don't really want to wear this, but it's like part of the cake malay culture. Mm. It's like, what they have underneath here is the, it's like the fez, the male. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Underneath the scarves. Okay. So that used to be part but, of the So they're Muslim? Yeah, they're Muslim. And then the, the dresses look a bit European? Yes, yeah. so this is the Dutch. Wow. Extraction, exploitation, and plundering are so rooted in colonialism that to fully understand the horrors of the system of apartheid in South Africa, we have to go back to its first colonizers, the Dutch. When the Dutch arrived at the Cape, the Aboriginal people here resisted the Dutch. Mm. So they had no option but to recruit people to become slaves in, um, in, in, in Cape Town. Driven by expansionist empire and ferocious capitalism, the Dutch were central to the slave trade in the Indian Ocean as they kidnapped men, women and children to work in their colonies. And when the indigenous people of the Cape refused to serve as the labor for the Dutch settlers, the Dutch brought over slaves from Indonesia, Madagascar and Malaysia. Hence the Malay Quarters. So we, this Kebukab is actually known as the Malay Quarters. Mm. And they were brought here to be slaves and they were later emancipated. After centuries of intermixing and influences from East and West and predominantly Islam, these slaves became what we know today as the Cape Malay community. One with its own culture, cuisine, music and language. Ah, 
When the slaves were emancipated in 1834, they continued to live in this neighborhood, in these homes. But here's the thing, they weren't always this bright and colorful. Because in that time, in the time of slavery, apparently the story goes like this, that all these houses were kept white. white yeah, you oh, weren't wow. allowed to, yeah. to paint it a color. Mm, you weren't allowed to paint it a color. And then um, w what they did was they started to paint their homes, uh, these brightly col colors, um, as a sort of symbol of their freedom. Mm. So it's a, met a great metaphor for freedom, wow. um, the, the colors wow. that you see today. When slavery ended and the Dutch were no longer in power, the British, followed by the Afrikaners, continued the exploitation but through different ways. This history of exploitation of black and brown bodies for labor is a defining feature of the centuries of oppression in South Africa that culminated in apartheid. The Cape Malay community is unique for so many reasons, but one of them is a symbol of having survived and resisted this thread of exploitation to build a community that thrives so brightly despite its dark past. So obviously there's a huge history here, colonial history, yeah. uh, driven to ethnically cleanse and forcibly remove communities yeah. from this land in favor of the colonizer and, and white yeah. people. But it, it managed to stay steadfast, it resisted. What, what is the story? World Cup was actually, or the Malay quarters, as it was known, was actually one of the areas that was protected under the, um, the, the, uh, the group areas act in the, mm. during the apartheid system. So, Every other race or, or, or type of people had to move out of the area, was forcefully moved mm. out of the area whilst the Malays had to remain here. This was in group uh, 1950 with the Group Areas Act. The Group Areas Act zoned Buakup as a colored area, so they weren't forcibly displaced from their neighborhood. But those in the Cape Malay community still played a pivotal role in the resistance to apartheid. Post-apartheid or especially in the later parts of Al-Qaeda, people started mixing and intermarriage happened. It was a natural progression of white things, but the Cape Malay is definitely, it's a, it's a form of identity and culture now more so. A big part of that culture is the food. We have yet to happen upon a restaurant that's open. I was dreaming of you. So we're going back to our cooking segment for a second. Alongside the curry, we're going to be making a roti a flatbread that we'll use to eat the curry with and mop up all the sauce. The Cape Malay style roti is a bit different to Indian roti in the sense that the Indian rotis are usually like not very flaky. It's mm. more just like flat and very thin and light. Whereas the Cape Malay style roti, it's a flaky roti. So you want your, your dough or the pastry actually like to flake off. We actually want to create like a dough now. So can you, I, I learned a very mind blowing fact when I hung out with you in, in, in Bukap that Afrikaans is actually not a white settler language. No, not at all, actually. So um, definitely um, the Dutch influence has a great role on the Afrikaans language. However, it was actually a language um, created by the slaves at the time. So the, the, the enslavers were Dutch and the slaves spoke Afrikaans to communicate with their fellow slaves so that the, the owners or the, yeah, the enslavers could not understand. understand. Mm. So it was also a form of resistance. And what is actually like the sad part of the history is that the language in the end became the language that oppressed. You know, growing up, um, so in the community that I'm from, I'm like from a predominantly colored community. So there was literally just colored people in my area and going to school and like mixing in, let's say, previously white spaces was like, I would feel very uncomfortable speaking with my accent and, and just using the words that I use. So I think I will drop a lot of slang as we, <laughs> we roll here, but, and I was very really like really embarrassed about that. And I would actually change the way I spoke when I would move in certain circles. And that was because I was ashamed of of the Afrikaans um, or the Kombais Afrikaans that would come through, you know. It, it's actually quite bizarre the way the language, like how, what language meant in different areas. So like in the colored community, Afrikaans was slightly frowned upon. So you knew that the Afrikaans people were usually, or the Afri colored Afrikaans people were like farm workers and people who worked for the white person. And that was the language I was exposed to. That was the Afrikaans. So it wasn't that I w didn't, I was more ashamed of 
the class of Afrikaans I was speaking. As weird as, as that may sound, but that is really what it was. And so I never spoke it because I didn't want to sound that way. <laughs> There's so much to, to unpack there. There's, the, there's the, the language which kind of brought us to this part of the conversation. There's you living in a predominantly colored community, which is something that still exists in Cape Town and probably other parts of South Africa, right? Communities uh, that belong to a specific race or categorization under apartheid still live together in different parts and they are segregated. And then it's moving between those different spaces. There's different parts of you that have to come out and, and language is a very big part of that. Sure. Salim, can I just check where you are with your, your dough? Salim was like, shut up. I want to see your dough. I just want to see you. Okay, it's nice and smooth. Does it feel smooth? It feels very smooth, yeah. Okay. And there I can see another mosque. Yes. That's the Burhanul uh, 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 Masjid. I wonder if the, if there's a stat on this being the most mosques per capita given, like in a community. I think it has so. to be up there. So something that caught my eye, we saw it uh, on top of the masjid. There was yeah. a Palestinian flag. On the same street, there's one, and there's two. Uh, tell me about Palestinian solidarity here. It seems to be quite strong. I think as a South African, just speaking about um, post-apartheid. Mm. Even pre-apartheid, Palestine was always spoken of mm. because, I mean, Nelson Mandela, he made it part of our apartheid struggle was the Palestinian struggle. And he said, we cannot be free if the Palestinians aren't free. It was incredible to see the solidarity for Palestine among the Cape Malay community. I felt very welcomed and it became the basis for my friendship with Selwa. All right, going in. Going in. Mmm. So I've been grating the garlic and, and ginger onto the top of the tomato. Should, I, should we add them now? Yes. For spices, we're working with turmeric, cumin, coriander, and leaf masala. We're going back to the roti. So Salim, just throw like a big area full of flour because we're going to throw it out like into a big square. Oh, yours is looking much more rolled out than mine. You just need to put your, put your back into it, Salim. Let's add our beans in the meantime. Butter beans. Okay. Can you show Salim how my food looks? Oh yeah. I can, I can see that. I can see that, Jacob. Thank you very much. If I send you a picture of my dough, I think you guys are going to have a heart attack from laughing. <laughs> It's looking rough, I'm not gonna lie. You are not winning, my brother. I like the shape. <laughs> the shape is just that I'm just, the, the butter looks still a bit hard, but it's okay. This is not the end. Okay, it's not the end. What about the beans? My beans look, my beans look good. <laughs> how does, how does these beans look? Let me see. You can see I feel beans. like my beans look fine. Okay, your beans do look fine. They look good. Thank God. Cooking the bean curry is going well so far, but finding it while I was in Cape Town on that particular day proved to be much more difficult. At this point, we walked the entire neighborhood multiple times, and I'm getting a little hangry. Don't be in a rush. If you're hungry, you're hungry. You won't die. No, I know when you're getting like <laughs> a little bit hangry or just like, can I eat now? Jacob, you know that also now. I feel like he's my girlfriend now. Yeah. But then, a miracle. Work I don't want. Adi Fatima! Sharif spotted a family friend who had a friend who found us a place to eat. Back at Faiza's home kitchen, we're about to get some uh, Cape Malay curry. Food that I've been really excited to try. And they serve butter bean curry. Yeah, let's do the full course. Yes. First were the appetizers and some Cape Malay classics. So what is this? Chili oh. She's gonna hate us by the time we leave. Mm. Oh, nice. <laughs> 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 
Wow. <laughs> you guys don't enjoy food the way I do. This is so yummy. Next were the mains. A warm, creamy, and spicy butter bean curry with a flaky buttery roti on the side to mop up all the sauce. The spices and the, mm. and, and the McKibbele spices that they... Mm. This is the vegetarian. Yes. Vegetarian. Mm. Yeah. Yummy, yummy. Boys, how you doing? You look dejected. <laughs> I've seen you in better times. Like <laughs> I'm this, just gonna taste this. This here is you need to eat it. Yeah. Famous lie. Mm -hmm. Or onion salad. You mm. But that was a part of the fake Malay cuisine. Salwa, we made it. <laughs> we, yeah. we, we made it. So we have uh, the the curry, butter bean curry, and the roti. Um, tell me. Shall we? Are we going to? Are we going to eat? <laughs> we're going to eat. We're so hungry. So I was like, feed me. <laughs> Stop talking. Let's eat. Let's let's have a have a okay. taste. You know, the fruits of our labor. Bismillah. Bismillah. Wow. That is delicious. It really is. Tastes the rice, Yeah. And this is very good. Butter It's good. Absolutely good. Absolutely good. Sahtain, sahtain. Advertising on the eye. Oh, yes. Assalamu alaikum. Oh, Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. The Cape Malay community in Bukhab felt so familiar, but also something so incredibly unique. Born out of the oppression of slavery into a colorful and vibrant culture that has so much exquisite beauty. We were able to get to know their history through their cuisine, because food tells a powerful story. I hope one day you all get to try some butter bean curry. I'm Salim Barame from Uncivilized Media. Subscribe to our channel and catch you on the next episode of this South Africa series.